Welcome, welcome, welcome over there, over there. Welcome, 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 welcome. And let me just be straight up with you guys, 100% honest. Our desire is for you to make the decision to make Downey First Christian Church your church home. And if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, we believe, I believe, following Jesus is the best thing that you can do. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, we're just happy that you're here with us. And uh, we welcome you. We welcome you. So um, also for those of you uh, who come here regularly, uh, it's just a reminder. It's just a reminder uh, to invite people to church, bring them to church, and um, you know we're going to give them a warm welcome, and we're so happy that you're here. So another thing that I want to remind you guys, some of you guys already know this, we are in our growth group uh, promotion month. And so lots of people have signed up for these groups, which is a great answer to prayer. If you don't know what a growth group is, a growth group is a group of about uh, 8 to 12 people that meet in different locations during the week to talk about the Bible, to talk about God and how how it relates uh, to our lives. I know there's something going on. I don't know if I can do anything to fix it or I should change microphones. I'm going to change the microphone. I'm going to go old school here. Okay. We'll do old, old faithful here. All right. Is that okay? Is that better? All right. All right. So um, growth group, if you haven't signed up for a growth group, this is your opportunity to do it because we believe that we learn in rows, but we actually grow in circles. So life change happens uh, in circles. And so if you're not in a group, I want to encourage you to sign up for a group. Uh, we have uh, tables outside where you can sign up for different groups. Uh, you can sign up on your connection card. You just put the code of the group that you want to be in. You put that code into the connection card and put it into one of those boxes. You can also sign up online. So just go to downyfirst.org and you can sign up online. But any information that you need, you can go out to those tables and sign up. I promise you, you will be glad that you did. Sound good? Good, 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 good. I'm excited. I'm excited. So we're continuing a series uh, called Connection. And uh, if you want to catch up with the different sermons that we preach throughout this series, you can go uh, online, Facebook. We've got it on YouTube. Uh, We've got an Instagram account. We have our podcast. So there's no excuse. You can catch up with the sermons. And uh, so we're continuing this series. Uh, Last week, uh, we had Connor and we had Francis and we had Shay on stage. Didn't they do a fantastic job? I just love, I just love having the new generation here just kind of, you know, uh, getting their feet wet and, and, and uh, you know, being able to deliver the word. And I'm so proud of these guys. I think they did a fantastic job. So uh, we're going to continue the series uh, today and we're going to go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. It says this, starting in verse 5. Starting in verse 5, it says this. Listen to this. This is very important. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So, so today I want to talk about this whole idea of, of connecting, connecting to your purpose, connecting to your purpose. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for your love, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, because we know, we believe that you are here in our midst, God. We welcome you into this place, and we thank you, Lord, because we believe that you have a word for us today, and we are expecting for you to speak to us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that no, nothing that has to do with the technology or anything that, that can interfere will allow Um, for our hearts to be closed, Lord, because we know that you have something that you want to share today, God. So we present ourselves to you this morning. We open our hearts, and we're expecting for you to speak to us, and not just to speak words into our life, but that we will allow for these words to be life-changing. We pray for this, and we thank you. And all those people said, 
Amen, 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 amen. So, quick question. What would you do if you had $100 million? What would you do? Don't raise your hand if you actually have $100 million, because we all hate you. And no, I'm just kidding. What, what, I, what, what would you do, honestly, what would you do that you can't do now that you would do if you had $100 million right now? What? To the, oh, to the church? Come on, man. Seriously? All right, we're going we're gonna to have to talk later. Amen to that. Amen to that. What else? What else? What else? What? Go to college. You? An iPhone 11. Wow, you're going to have a lot of money left over after that one. Cheryl? I buy my sister a house and set her up trust fund so she's taken care of. That's great. I like that. That's a good one. That's a good one. Anyone else? Anyone else? Back there? I heard something. Climate change. Climate change. Okay. All right. Let's, let's just move on, okay? Let's just move on. That's, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yes. So, um, how many of you would, qu would quit your jobs? All right. If you don't have a job, that's a different story. How many of you would quit your jobs? I'm not raising my hand. Okay. How many of you would not quit your jobs? Okay, 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 that's interesting. Also, another question. How many of you, when you think about having $100 million, um, would, would, would tend to, to invest it and save it? Like, that would be your tendency. That's me. On the other hand, who, who has, would have the tendency to, to just spend it and enjoy it? Okay, okay, that's about half. That's about half and half, about half and half. So, uh... Some people say that with $100 million, um, people change. Like, money changes people. Would you agree with that? I don't. I respectfully disagree with that. I think that money actually highlights who you really are on the inside. Like, if you're, if you're, if you're nice, you're going to be a lot nicer with $100 million. If you're a jerk, you're going to be much more of a jerk with $100 million. Right? So we know that. We know that. So what I would do personally with $100 million, the first thing that comes into my mind is pay off my house. I'd pay off my house. Some of you guys would take a trip. You would invest the money. You would help your parents. You would go uh, save money for college and all that, that kind of stuff. So there are many different things that come to our minds. But usually what comes into our minds are things that have to do with ourselves, with making your life better, with making your life more comfortable, with making it more fun, with making it uh, feel more fulfilling, with securing your future, with making your money grow, because it's your money. So obviously, if you have that money, that money was given to you for you, right? So what's true with our finances is also true with everything else. I heard someone once say that we all have three things. We have three things, and these three things start with the same letter. They start with the letter T. Time, treasure, and talent. So we all have time, treasure, and talent, meaning that we have time, which is like 70 to 80 years approximately that we have on this earth. We have talent. We have T, different talents that we have that are limited and are different. And we also have our treasure, which is the amount of finances or, or uh, resources that we have. And these are the things that we all have. But there's an assumption that comes with that. That the reason why I have the things that I have, are it's for my own benefit. Because if it wasn't for me, then why would God give them to me? If he wanted them for someone else... He would give it to someone else, right? Why are you laughing? It's obvious, right? If I have money, I'll, I'll make it grow. I'll put it into mutual funds or do something with it. If I have talent, I need to make my talent grow. Um, if I have this amount of time, I have to make good use of my time. I have to see the world. I have to do all these things that have to do with the things that I want to do. And it seems obvious because it's all about me, so, so the question is, is, what do the scriptures have to say about this? Because it seems pretty obvious to me that if I have the things that I have, it's because God gave them to me for me. It's obvious, right? See, here's the problem. We're in church, and obvious, no one cares about obvious. 
We have to see what the Bible says, and we have to align what we assume that is obvious into what the Word of God says. So what does the Bible say? Romans chapter 12. I'm just going to warn you, this is going to be like the anti-motivational uh, speech. Just be ready for it. Romans 12 verse 1 says this. Therefore, it says, I urge you, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a, say it with me, yes. holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who here wants to discover what God's perfect and pleasing will is? All of us, right? That's why we're here. So what is it that Paul is saying? He's answering the question of purpose. What is God's will for my life? What do I do with what I have? What do I need to do with the things that I have? What is the purpose of the things that I have? And he gives us the answer, he says this, he says, become a living sacrifice. Now, what does that mean? Being a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, right, we had dead sacrifices, which meant you, you present an animal or something on, onto the altar, and that dead animal would represent what should have happened to you, and then it clears the way so you can have a correct relationship with God. That was the Old Testament, we, we could call that, that was the, those were the dead sacrifices. And fast forward, Jesus comes in to the scene, and he's, uh, he's the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, and he dies once and for all, sins of the past, present, and future. He replaces the whole, the whole uh, sacrificial system. That way, we no longer have to present dead sacrifices. So what happens now is we're free and clear. So now, we can live however we want. No? Okay, good. Good. What is he saying? We don't have to be dead sacrifices, but now we have to be living sacrifices. We have to be living sacrifices. We're not called to die for God because Christ already died for us. We are called to live for him. That is a living sacrifice. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Very simply, it means I take my time, my talent, and my treasure, and I place it before the altar, and I, and, I, and I kill it. Everything that I want, I present it before God as a living set. My whole life, I present before him, and I kill it. Now, the opposite is the assumption, right? So this is actually the opposite of we assume. Everything that I have that God gave me is for me. No. It's all for him. All of it is for him. And that, brothers and sisters, is the will of God for your life. That is your purpose. This is so important to understand because the death of Jesus, the de listen to this, the death of Jesus is not just a reality but it's also an illustration of how we are supposed to live our own lives. Luke 9.23 says this. This is very important. Luke 9.23 says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? What does it mean to deny yourself? It's the whole idea of I have a plan for my life. I'm going to deny that plan and I'm going to go after whatever God has me to do. Take up their cross daily and follow me. That's what that means. You see, Jesus' purpose, his big ambition in life was what? To die. And guess what? That should be ours as well. So your purpose in short is this. Your purpose is to die. You're thinking, I'm so glad I came today. <laughs> this is great. Not a physical death. Jesus did that for us. But die to yourself. Die to your dreams. Die to your, die to your ambitions. 
die to your aspirations, die to your agenda, die to your plan. And this is true in all areas of our life, in relationships. Do you want to, do you want to know the secret of, of, a, of a good relationship? Do you want to know the secret of a healthy marriage? I've been married for 17 years. The secret of a healthy re, uh, marriage is death. So, so marriage is a death sentence if you want to make it work. <laughs> okay? If you want to make friendships work, a good friendship, a good, deep, meaningful friendship, it is a death sentence. The same thing in your, is in your relationship with, with people at work. If you want to make friendships and relationships deep, you have to die to yourself. You see, the essence of true love is, is death. True love is about dying to yourself. John 15, 13 says this. John 15, 13 says, says greater, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. See, death, we see death throughout the whole scripture talking about this whole idea of giving yourself up for others. It's the essence of the gospel. You cannot truly love if you are not willing to die. Death is such an important thing. Die to being right all the time. <laughs> Gotta die to that. Die to winning the argument. Die to making your point. I gotta make this point. This person, this person has to understand that they are wrong. And as a result of that, you lose the relationship. Death to those things. Death to your plans. Die to your personal goals and ambitions. Die to your dreams. Die to all these things. And you may say, Pastor, you are killing me. No pun intended. <laughs> but seriously, this is what Jesus did. And it's what we are called to do. We are, in, we are to be his disciples. Do what he does. He goes to the cross. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 7. We're going we're gonna to do this one again. Uh, a couple of verses, 7, 8, and 9 says this. Philippians 2, uh, chapter uh, 7 says, Rather he made himself nothing. This is Jesus. Nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and then it continues saying being found in appearance as a man this is jesus he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every other name what is the point that paul is trying to make here with this whole process of the death and resurrection of jesus what is he saying that not only because we because we're familiar with this part the part of him humbling himself like like he died on the cross, that we hear that a lot. You know, he humbled himself to the lowest point. But, but then there's the, the, the reminder that he comes from the highest point. So not only did he go to the lowest point, but he came from the highest point. There's no higher point that anyone could ever be on, and there's no lower point that anyone could ever be at. So he goes from the highest to the lowest point. So why is he saying this? Why is this important to understand? Because it leaves us without any excuses. Oh, man, I can't die to that, man. I can't die to this. You know, I can't die to my perfectly uh, planned out life from now into retirement and all these things that I have planned. I can't die to using my time for me and for the things that are interesting to me. Pastor, you don't understand what he did to me, what she did to me, what they did to me. There's no way that I can die to my pride because you don't understand what they did. Well, guess what? Jesus came from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. We have no excuses. We have no excuses. Death means dying to all of it. And it's what Jesus did. See, the essence of love is death. And you cannot claim, we cannot claim to love Jesus if we don't die to ourselves. I know this is even hard to picture because here's the assumption. Here's the assumption. Listen to this. Here's the assumption that we make when we're talking about death to ourselves. The assumption is that if we die to ourselves, the result of death to ourselves is going to be that we are going to walk in a miserable life. I'm not going to die to myself. That means that my life is going to be terrible from now on. What about the abundant life that we talk about and we promise in John 
10, 10, let's read that, read that real, real quick here. And John 10, 10 says, it says the thief comes only to, to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus, I have come that they, they may have life and have it to the full. What about that life? You, Pastor, you're asking me to die to myself. And then this other passage is saying that he came to give us a full life. That is a contradiction. Actually, it's not. You see, here's the beautiful thing. Death is actually an invitation for us to walk in life that is truly life. You see, in the same way that Jesus' death does not end there, we know that. Our death to ourselves does not end in death to ourselves. You see, Jesus humbled himself. And then how does the verse continue? He humbled himself. And then what happened on the third day? He was exalted. Same is true for us. James 4.10 says this, humble yourselves before the Lord. And then it ends, right? No. And he will lift you up. You see, there's an assumption that, that death to ourselves means death to happiness, death to fulfillment. My life is going to be terrible. I gave myself up. And then from now on, it's just going to be horrible. It's actually not true. That is a lie from the enemy. Think about this. What happens when, when you die to pride? What happens when you die to self-sufficiency? What happens when you die to anger? What, what happens when you die to greed, to lust, to addictions, to controlling everyone? What happens when you die to those things? What's the result of that? It's a miserable life, right? We know this. See, we know this. We know these things. It's the opposite. It is a life of purpose. It is a life of fulfillment. And it is a life of freedom. Here's what happens. When you die to yourself, when I die to myself, that death to yourself comes with a promise of resurrection into a new life that is truly life. If we live for ourselves, we'll never be fulfilled. We don't, we, this, is, this is things that we know, but sometimes we insist on doing our own thing. Now, here's the problem is that we love the resurrection part. The resurrection part is great. We love it. We love, he has risen. You know, praise God. You know, everything is great. Everything is happy. That's the part that I want. Well, guess what? There's an essential part of the resurrection that we hate. But it has to happen and there are no shortcuts, my friends. There's no fast track to this. Death to yourself. This is a requirement to be a true follower of Jesus. Luke chapter 9 says this. Luke 9, verse, uh, starting at verse 23. Then he said to them all, this is Jesus talking, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever, if anyone wants to be my disciple, here's what you got to do. You must deny, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And it continues, it says this, for whoever, for whoever wants to save their life, I got my plan. I got the things that I want to do. I got my, my time, my talent, and my treasure, and I've got plans for all these things. If anyone wants to follow me, has to take up their cross daily. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. If you save it, you lose it. If you lose it, you save it. That's why it's counterintuitive. What good is it? Imagine just Jesus is telling you this right now. What good is it if someone to gain the whole world? Hey, you gained everything. All of your plans went perfectly how you had them in your mind. Gained the whole world and yet forfeit their very self. You, you gained everything, but you lost everything. Romans 8.13 says this. If you, 8.13 says, Romans 8.13 says, for, for if you live according to the flesh, do what I want, my plans, my, my agenda, all the things that I want, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Colossians 3, 5 says this. It says, it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly na nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You see, death to yourself to the things that you want, to your agenda, comes with a promise, what I said earlier, into resurrection, into a life that is truly life. But in order for there to be a resurrection, it's one thing that needs to happen. 
It's essential. If not, there's no resurrection. In order for there to be a resurrection, there has to be a death. There has to be. This is essential for us to understand. So here's my, my question, and I'm going to close with this. It's a question. This is for you. This is for each one of you. This is for me, of course. This is the question is, what, what is it in your life that you need to put to death? What is it in my life that I need to put to death? You see, because maybe you're here and you need a resurrection in your life. You need a resurrection in your life. You're, you need a resurrection in your marriage. You need a resurrection in your finances. You need a resurrection in your health. You need a resurrection in your relationships. You need a resurrection in your, in your negative thinking that you just can't get rid of. Maybe there's a habit that you have that you just can't kick and you need a resurrection in your life because that habit is sucking the life out of you. And maybe you're here and you're starting to lose hope. You're thinking this is, I've just tried, I've tried everything and it's just not happening. Like I've tried so hard for this area of my life to resurrect and it just seems impossible. You're thinking in your mind, there is no way, there's no way that this relationship will rise again. There's no way that my finances will rise again. There's no way that my health is going to rise again. There's no way that this habit that I have, I'm going to be able to rise out of it. There's no way you're thinking that. And I understand. And call me crazy, but if Jesus died and he was buried and one day went by and a second day went by, and a third day went by, and nobody, there was this, it was this, it was, yeah, he died. There's no way for him to rise again. Now call me crazy, but if, if Jesus Christ can rise on the third day, anything that you're going through right now, you can rise out of it. Your relationships, your finances, anything that you're going through right now, but it is hard. And like Jesus in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39. He's in Gethsemane, and, and Gethsemane, he was, there was this moment where I believe that this is where the battle was won for Jesus, where he was, he, was, he, was sweating, he was sweating drops of blood and asking God, God, please, if it's your will, don't allow for me to have to go through this. And he was just in agony. He was in agony. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to go. And maybe you're here, and that's what you're thinking in your own life. You know there's something you have to put to death. And you're thinking, I can't do this. I don't have the strength to do this. I can't go through this. But you need a resurrection. In your addiction, maybe. Maybe you have a toxic relationship that you need to let go. Maybe there's a habit, a thought pattern, negativity. Maybe it's an even an unhealthy diet that you can't kick. You don't know what else to do. You're in your Gethsemane right now. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask everyone, if you could just close your eyes. And no one looking around. This moment is for you. This moment is for you. This moment is for you if you need a resurrection in your life. I just want to think about, I want you guys to please think about that area in your life that you need a resurrection in. What is it? toxic relationship, an addiction, a habit, thought patterns, negativity, something in your life that seems impossible. You've lost faith in that, kind of given up on it. I want you to think about that for a little bit. And I want to pray for you. And this prayer, I can't, I can't personally do anything for you. But Jesus Christ can absolutely do it. So if you're here and you need prayer for any of these areas, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Amen. 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 All right, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we are here because we believe that you are here. We believe that you are in this place right now and we welcome you. And we cry out to you this morning knowing that you can turn everything around for us in our lives. I thank you, Lord, because you invite us to die. I thank you, Lord, because you made that clear this morning. 
that you've invited us to, to walk the path that you walked, to die to ourselves so that we can raise into this life that is truly life. But there's a death that needs to take place. Maybe there's something that we need to do and it's probably different for everyone, God. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's cutting off a relationship. Maybe it's making a hard, hard decision. I pray, Lord, that as we're in our Gethsemane right now, trying to, to gain the strength to do what we know that we have to do, that you'll give us the, the strength to say, just like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. I pray for this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.